In the 1930s and 40s, one woman worked to change the stigma of adoption. What people didn't know was how she was aligning her pockets along the way by scamming, grifting, and outright kidnapping children. I'm Charlie, and welcome to Crime Lines. Welcome to day nine of the 12 Days of Crime Lines. This is a case today that I have been interested in for years, but it doesn't really fit what I cover here on Crime Lines usually. One of the main reasons is that it's been covered so many times before, and I really wasn't sure that I had anything to add to the previous coverage. And maybe I don't. So that makes more sense to cover it as extra content like this rather than a regular episode. This is also an episode that is going to concentrate more on the perpetrator than the victims. Because honestly, this could be a 10-part series. This is a huge story. And I don't think I could do a usual Crime Lines deep dive on this without making it multiple parts. But by doing it in this format instead lets us zoom in on certain points on the timeline that will help our understanding of how this happened, as well as issues that still affect us today when we're talking about adoption. This is the case of the infamous kidnapper, human trafficker, and adoption scammer, Georgia Tan. I want to thank Haley from Haley Gray Research for her research assistance with this one. Let's start with Georgia, who was born Beulah George Tan in July 1891. She was named for both of her parents, Beulah and George. The family lived in the small town of Hickory, Mississippi, located about 20 miles west of Meridian, Mississippi. George Tan, Georgia's father, was a judge in the Chancery Court in Mississippi. Chancery courts cover family court issues like divorces and custody and adoptions, along with some other issues. These are all matters that don't tend to go before juries and are handled by judges. George was the chancellor over the second district, with the courthouse located in Meridian. Georgia Tan later said that hearing her father talk about the adoptions and show an interest in the children was what led her to the same interest in social work and child welfare. As a child, Georgia studied the piano. Among their social class, it was expected that there would be some type of musical training. But Georgia's father thought she had what it took to be a talented musician and a concert pianist, so he pushed her far beyond her interest level. Georgia attended Martha Washington College and graduated in 1913 at the age of 22. She moved back home and taught high school music classes for a little while. But Georgia was more passionate about the law and wanted to become an attorney. While her father helped her study for and pass the bar exam, he didn't want her to actually practice law. It was unusual for a woman to be a practicing attorney. I wondered why her father helped her learn the law if he didn't want her to practice the law. And all I can think of is he thought she would have gotten married somewhere along the way and become a housewife. But she didn't. Georgia showed no interest in marriage, at least not to a man. And she also didn't have a desire to defy her father. So in spite of passing the bar and being a full-grown adult free to do as she chose, Georgia never became an attorney. So Georgia had no interest in marriage. She didn't want to teach for the rest of her life. And she was not interested in pursuing music any longer. There weren't too many options left for an educated young woman of her class in the early 1900s. It's not like she would have considered becoming a domestic servant. So instead, Georgia went into social work. She first worked for the Mississippi Children's Home Society at the Kate McWillie Powers Receiving Home for Children. 
Also working in the home as a house mother was a friend of Georgia's named Anne Atwood. Anne was eight years younger than Georgia and definitely had a different upbringing. Her family was impoverished even before her father's death, which occurred when she was around 10, and left her mother the single parent of seven children. Unable to support them all, according to Anne's niece, the children were eventually split up. In 1920, Georgia resigned from her job in Mississippi and got a new job in Texas with some help from her father and his political connections. The reason Georgia made this move isn't entirely clear. In one version of the story, Georgia chose to leave the job for another opportunity, and in another, she was asked to leave because she was not following the rules when it came to placing children in adoptive homes. Georgia had developed a philosophy of sorts in this time. She observed that in wealthy families, should a child need care, they could go to another relative. Almost all of the children who ended up in the home came from impoverished families, and the only people who could afford to adopt a child were wealthy. There are two things that Georgia learned from this scenario. One was that through adoption, you could raise a child's social status, moving them from an inferior position, inferior in her view, to a superior one. And by inferior and superior, she means poor and wealthy. Again, that's her opinion, not mine. The second thing she learned was that wealthy people could afford adoption and they were able and willing to pay to get the type of child they wanted. When Georgia left Mississippi for Texas, she worked for the Texas Children's Society in Fort Worth. According to the 1920 census, Georgia's friend Ann Atwood lived in the same boarding house as Georgia. And this is something we see going forward. Wherever Georgia went, so did Ann. It's widely accepted that the two women were in a long-term romantic relationship and lived together under what was known as a Boston marriage. To outsiders, they were just two single women who could support themselves and live together for convenience in a world dominated by men. But this concept was also a good cover for women who were intimately involved, which it is believed Anne and Georgia were. A year after Georgia arrived in Texas, a baby girl named June Ann was born in June 1921. At some point before she was two years old, Georgia adopted her. According to what June Ann told family members later, Georgia provided for her well financially, but there was an emotional detachment there to the degree that June Ann wondered why Georgia had bothered adopting a child at all. In 1924, Georgia, June, and Ann all moved to Memphis, Tennessee, where Georgia got a job at the Tennessee Children's Home Society. The Tennessee Children's Home Society started in 1897, and it was the oldest adoption agency in Tennessee. It was originally located in Nashville, but then they opened up branches in 1913 in Knoxville, Chattanooga, Jackson, and Memphis. So the home that Georgia was working at didn't take kids from all over the state, but rather those who lived in and around Memphis. In early 1925, while in Memphis, Anne gave birth to a son named George Allen Hollinsworth. Anne, at that point, started using the same last name and went by Anne Atwood Hollinsworth. She would sometimes even style herself as Mrs. Jack Hollinsworth in spite of never being married. And this would give people the impression that she had been married and was possibly divorced or widowed. It negated the stigma of having a child out of wedlock. Before long and in a series of promotions, Georgia ended up being the supervisor to the entire Memphis branch of the Tennessee Children's Home Society. And I think a misconception about Georgia Tanout there from those who don't know the case well 
is that she was operating in secret or she was one of the unregistered and unregulated baby farms that we hear about in other cases like Amelia Dyer. She wasn't. Georgia operated under the authority of the state that approved the Memphis branch opening, and she was fully funded, getting over $18,000 a year in state funding. That's over $320,000 today. When Georgia took over at the Memphis home, she had the authority to handle adoptions the way she chose. And she truly changed people's hearts and minds about adoption. I will never in a million years say that what happened next was worth any benefit gained from it. Most of what she did, even if it helped others, was primarily for her own gain. But if we don't really talk about it, we're not going to understand how she became so deeply trusted that she ended up getting away with literal human rights violations. For a very long time, the adoption of a child who was not a family member was seen as an inferior way to grow a family. Not just not as good as biological children, which we sometimes still see today, but it was almost taboo. So in the early 1900s and into the 1920s, when we're seeing adoptions, they're often not adopting children as family members. They were being adopted to be a servant or even a farmhand. But one of the questions on George's adoption application was supposedly aimed to weed out these types of adoptions as she asked, what is your object in taking a child? Georgia marketed adoption as an altruistic way people with money could grow their families and help the less fortunate. And I specifically choose the word marketed because that's exactly what she did. She placed hundreds of ads in newspapers with pictures of children available for adoption and captions that some people wouldn't even use for pet adoptions today. Things like advertising an eight-month-old baby as a Christmas present. Locally, Georgia and or her employees would go door to door and tell people about how much it cost to house the children in the state-funded home and said that adoption prevented tax money from going to funding these orphanages or going to unfit parents who were getting welfare benefits. And by unfit, Georgia really just meant impoverished. She told people they were doing a good deed for the child and society by adopting. All of these things actively changed the perception of adoption in the United States. And that's because she didn't stick to Memphis. Georgia sent booklets out of state to advertise the children. She liked out-of-state adoptions for one primary reason. Tennessee residents could adopt for $7, but out-of-state adoptions cost $750, all payable to the agency Georgia was in charge of. This money was earmarked to go back to the state as they funded everything, and in the beginning, it did. But that wasn't all Georgia would charge the families. She would start adding on attorney's fees and travel costs things that didn't cost nearly what she said they did and were supposed to actually come out of the adoption fee. She would pocket the extra. In addition to boosting her bank account, this out-of-state advertising also boosted George's name in the adoption world as an expert on child welfare, adoption services, adoption advocacy, and adoption law. She was invited on speaking and lecture tours where she was called a national authority on adoption and the mother of modern adoption. As a public figure, she spoke to Eleanor Roosevelt about child welfare, and she was invited to the presidential inauguration by Harry Truman himself. But behind the scenes, Georgia was skirting around procedures. 
a fully legal, appropriately vetted adoption by 1930 standards would take 6 to 12 months to complete. But a Georgia tan adoption could often be turned around much faster. One major corner cut is pretty horrifying. Background checks on the adoptive families. Rather than do any actual investigation or interviews or even follow up on the references provided, Georgia would visit the home, talk to the family a bit, and then rubber stamp the application. She was mostly looking, it seems, to see if they could afford to pay. Wealth was a major factor for Georgia when it came to placing a child. It trumped pretty much everything else, and it's pretty obvious because a question on her rather short adoption application was if the family had hired help. Regardless, Georgia's reputation locally and nationally was favorable, and the Memphis home was known for its speed and efficacy in placing children in homes, particularly infants, because that's what most people wanted, an infant or a young child. It got to where Georgia had a waiting list of prospective parents in 1935, and seeing dollar signs on each one of those applications she decided she needed to find babies for each one. Like I've made it pretty clear, Georgia was a classist, as she felt poor parents were inferior because of their socioeconomic status. That was definitely one of her motivations, but the biggest one was her greed, as she realized how much money she could make moving a child from a poor family to a rich one who was willing to pay or even bribe to get to the head of the list. Not everyone knew that they were paying more than they were supposed to. They trusted the sweet and matronly Georgia Tan when she told them how much needed to be paid. And it was when she ran out of children who had been placed in the home legally that Georgia's sloppy and hasty adoptions turned into trafficking. And it's important to note that she did not work alone. She couldn't have. From the start, Georgia had some doctors on her side. The 1920s and 30s were when there was a major and massive shift from home births with either doctors or midwives to hospital births. The main thing driving this wasn't that hospital births were safer. Looking at the statistics we have, they definitely were not. However, Hospitals had something that homes did not, and that was anesthesia options. At this time, we're not talking epidurals, but rather sedation. Georgia used this to her advantage. She would work with doctors to over-sedate mothers and convince them to sign paperwork to get medical care for their child, but they were actually signing over their rights. They would then ask about their babies later and be told that maybe the baby died or they would even be just ignored and sent home. Sometimes the mothers would be convinced while drugged up that their medical bills would be astronomical, a huge strain on their family that was already struggling financially. But they wouldn't have to pay if they signed custody over. And with others, they would be told their baby was a stillborn from the start. You might wonder how they were convinced of this when babies cry at birth and they would know that wasn't true. But it goes back to that sedation. My grandmother told me that when my father was born, she went to the hospital in labor. They gave her gas and the next thing she remembered was holding a baby. Her memory of the childbirth was entirely erased. That's one of the reasons why epidurals became so popular. You can have the pain relief while still being aware that your baby is being born. Now, when Georgia would get these babies, literally hours old, she would take some to the Memphis home, but others would go to other homes she called nursing homes within the state. You would think, knowing how much money Georgia would make on the adoptions, that caring for those babies would be top priority, but it wasn't. Georgia would disregard doctors' advice on their care. 
At the time, commercial baby formula was available, but a lot of people still used homemade formulas, and Georgia fed the babies whatever she decided to feed them, regardless of what the doctor said. Some of the babies needed additional medical care, which they were not given, and yes, babies died because of the neglect of Georgia and those who she employed to care for the infants. And this was likely just to save a few dollars. The fake baby deaths and real baby deaths were significant enough that we see it in the historical record. During the time Georgia was in charge of the Memphis branch, Shelby County had the highest infant mortality rate in the entire country. Georgia didn't only kidnap babies. She knew she could get more money from prospective adoptive parents with infants, but that didn't mean she stopped with older children. While some of the children in her care had lost both parents or were coming out of a bad situation, some were not. Some were literally lured into cars and actually kidnapped. They would be at a playground or walking alone, and a car would pull up, driven by the unassuming Georgia Tan. At this time, a lot of kids had never taken a ride in a car before, particularly those who were poor. It's no surprise Georgia would go drive through a shanty town looking for unsupervised children. She would offer them a ride in her car, and once they were inside, she would tell them that their parents had died or couldn't care for them anymore, and then they would be brought to the Memphis home. One woman told her story of how she was taken at the age of eight while her mother was in the hospital and the older siblings were looking after her. She and her twin sister were adopted to another family out of state. With children being kidnapped out of their yards and off the streets, you'd think someone would have alerted the authorities. And they did. But the issue was that the authorities were either knowingly in on the scam and bribed into participating, or they were taken in by Georgia's kindly, respectable society lady act and thought they were helping. At the top of this list was Edward Crump, a major political boss in Tennessee and specifically in Memphis. Though he was mayor of the city for just a few years, he essentially handpicked every mayor who was in office while Georgia Tan was running her scheme. Like political bosses tended to be, he wielded his power for the political causes that mattered to him. Things like building a state-of-the-art fire department and creating jobs. But he also abused his power for himself and his friends, friends like Georgia Tan. If Crump told you to support Georgia's goals of adopting out these kids into quote-unquote better homes, you did it if you wanted to keep your job. One of the ways Crump avoided becoming the subject of criticism over the years was by throwing other people under the bus at the first whiff of scandal. So if you wanted to keep your government job and not get blamed when things go sideways, you didn't just do what Crump said. You made sure you kept it quiet. I will say it seems Crump may not have been 100% aware of everything going on in the home. There are people who believe Crump was actively meddling in this situation to protect Georgia Tan. But Crump had his fingers in all of the pies, so I have to wonder how much he was closely overseeing Georgia Tan or her adoption network. He very well could have thought, like a lot of people did, that Georgia was a social worker who was passionate about finding homes for children. Now, he certainly looked the other way, and he didn't worry himself with little things like if Georgia was skimming money off the top, so he definitely doesn't come out of this clean by any measure. But I would have to do a lot more looking into this before I'm willing to implicate him in kidnapping children. But I can't deny that his support definitely allowed this to happen. That and some bribes Georgia would pay along the way. 
city workers would go as far as to change birth certificates to falsify the names of the parents so that the link between the child and their birth parents was completely broken. They would then make up fake stories about their parents, like the father was a doctor, in order to make the child seem more desirable to prospective parents. They did similar things with birth dates, shaving a year or two off of older kids and a month or two off of infants to make them seem younger and therefore more desirable. Georgia would also scan the applications of the parents on her waiting list. And if she saw something like how the family was Jewish and wanted to adopt a Jewish child, Georgia would alter the paperwork to reflect that the birth mother was Jewish. While Georgia Tan had a number of people helping her, it's pretty clear that no one helped Georgia more than Judge Camille Kelly, the judge over Shelby County Family Court. Judge Kelly was appointed in 1920, and she was one of only two female judges in the entire region. Much like Georgia Tan, she came across as an older society woman, kind if not a little smug. She seemed like the last person to be touched by corruption, yet she was among the worst. As the judge over family court, she could issue orders to remove children from homes which she did. She had an informant who worked in welfare. This person was regularly in contact with families in the county who were reaching out for assistance. And this person would then pass the names of these families with cute young children or who had recently had babies to Judge Kelly. And Judge Kelly would issue a removal order to have the children taken by the state, and placed in Georgia Tan's home. It's unknown what Judge Kelly gained from this. One report from the State Department of Public Welfare claimed she did not profit monetarily, or they at least didn't find evidence she did, but I have a hard time believing that. Accessing the courts was difficult for these families, but occasionally some would file an appeal to get their children back. This was easy enough to deal with as long as the appeal ended up in front of a judge who Georgia or Judge Kelly had a relationship with. A quick bribe and the parents would lose their appeal. And that's if they even got that far. Georgia would threaten parents that they would be arrested for neglect or have their other children removed from their home if they fought the removal of the child she was hoping to adopt out. When Georgia got a highly adoptable child in her care, she would try to get them out the door as quickly as possible, even leaving with them in the middle of the night to meet with the intended parents. And that was another way she kept the kids from their families. By the time the parents lodged a complaint, the child was out of state. Of the around 5,000 children Georgia adopted out, about 1,000 of them came through Judge Kelly's court orders. Now, Georgia had more than 5,000 children in her care. That number is the estimate in how many she adopted out. That doesn't include those who died. Due to the falsified documents, it is hard to know how many died at the Memphis home while Georgia Tan was in charge. She owned a mass plot where around 20 children had been buried. But we know that isn't all, because in 1945, around 40 children died of dysentery when there was an outbreak. Through those who have done archival research and tried to piece it all together, the estimate is around 500 babies and children who died in Georgia's care. Reports of child abuse, physical and sexual, as well as neglect at the hands of the employees of the Memphis home are extensive. The conditions were poor and that encouraged the spread of disease. Some reports say that Georgia Tan and her employees purposely withheld care from children who were hard to place in the hope they would die. Some adoptive parents reported receiving children who were so sick and malnourished and dehydrated that they needed emergency medical care. 
None of this seemed to concern Georgia. What mattered to her was the money. Not only was she nickel and diming the adoptive families, she was also stealing from the state. When things worked out the way she hoped, she was keeping about 90% of the money she brought in. Georgia realized that she was on a bit of an honor system with the state. What she reported to them was what they accepted. The number of kids in and kids out were all in her control. And when it came to out-of-state adoptions, there was almost zero oversight. So she would send two of her employees to New York or California with four to six babies who were matched with adoptive parents. They would meet at a hotel. And if the parents decided to take the baby, they would write out the check for the $750 adoption fee plus whatever fees Georgia had tacked on. The parents were told that this fee went directly to expenses like medical care and transportation and that the Memphis home, which was state-supported, did not make a profit. So they would write out the check not to the home, but to Georgia Tan personally, who then was supposedly paying all of the expenses. So these employees would leave six babies behind and take six checks with them. Georgia would then report to the state that a single baby was adopted out on that out-of-state trip. She would claim the other five babies were adopted in-state, which had a much lower adoption fee. So Georgia would have collected $4,500 in adoption fees that were supposed to go to the state, plus whatever she tacked on that she wasn't supposed to, but then she would report only one out-of-state adoption and five in-state adoptions, so she would only have to send the state $785 total. The rest of the money went into her personal bank account. Not everyone turned a blind eye to what Georgia was doing. The Child Welfare League of America found Georgia's advertisements for children inappropriate, to say the least. Adoption placement needed to be a little more refined than answering a newspaper ad. They wrote to Georgia to request she stop advertising and publishing the photos of the children in the way she was. But Georgia kept doing it, so they wrote to her again and again. And when she continued to ignore them, they took a look at Georgia Tan and the Memphis home a little more closely in the early 1940s, and they didn't like what they found. They tried to look at the actual adoptions and the process, and that's when they learned that Georgia would destroy adoption paperwork, which she claimed was in line with state privacy laws, but it definitely was not. Sealing a legal record does not mean getting rid of it. It just means don't show it to people. What the Child Welfare League could see of Georgia's process, they saw issues from the start. For one thing, her staff at the Memphis home were undertrained for the job and did not get proper direction in day-to-day operations. Then there were the adoption ads, which is what kicked this off to begin with. Then when it came to the children, Georgia wasn't prioritizing the child. She didn't bother to learn the child's heritage or background. She didn't take time to get to know the children or the adoptive parents much at all with how quickly these adoptions would go through. She wasn't matching parents and children based on the best home for the child. Rather, she was letting parents essentially baby shop. They also raised concerns about the swift out-of-state placements. People would show up at a hotel with a check and leave with a baby. Who inspected their home? Who supervised them after? Who did background checks on these parents? The answer was no one. While the Child Welfare League did not uncover the really dark issues with what Georgia Tan was doing as far as kidnapping children and taking advantage of vulnerable families, they saw enough, even without that, to stop endorsing the Memphis House in 1941. This was actually a very big deal, though it didn't immediately stop or even slow Georgia Tan. So in 1946, with it looking like nothing was really happening, Shelby County's probate judge, Sam O. Bates, 
wrote to the Commissioner of Public Welfare of the state of Tennessee. In his seven-page letter, Judge Bates went through everything the Child Welfare League had found, and he built the case for a full investigation of the Memphis home. The reason the judge wanted the investigation was because if these accusations were true, he didn't feel he could, as a judge, approve any adoptions coming out of the Memphis home. But the governor at the time, Jim McCord, wouldn't do it. Supposedly, he didn't want undue publicity on the situation during a legislative session. But it might also be because his career was courtesy of who else but Edward Crump, who was still backing Georgia Tan. In spite of the concerns raised, Georgia's home got a bit of a boost in publicity in 1947 when actress Joan Crawford adopted twins from the Memphis home. Their mother, who was unwed, died a week after their birth from kidney failure. In 1949, a new governor took office in Tennessee, Gordon Browning. Browning had defeated the Crump-backed Jim McCord, which was a huge blow to the Crump political machine. But that's a whole story for a different podcast. Browning saw the accusations against the Memphis home, and in 1950, he ordered Memphis attorney Robert Taylor to investigate. Part of his motivation was financial. One of Browning's main goals while he was in office was to stabilize the state's finances. And he saw how much money was going into the home versus how much the state was getting in the adoption fees. He wanted to make sure the state was getting all the money they were supposed to to offset what they were paying out. Yes. The unraveling of Georgia's schemes had little to do with the children and the families affected and everything to do with her stealing from the government. This investigation did blow the lid off of everything. Even just the word of the investigation led to major media coverage within days, exposing what the Children's Welfare League had uncovered and more. On September 13, 1950, it was reported by multiple papers that the home was a black market for babies and that it had been run that way for at least 10 to 15 years. Georgia and those who were compensated to help her run the black market side of the home made around $1 million, which is more like $11 million in today's money. The home was shut down pretty much immediately, and there were 22 children currently in their care. It's not clear if Georgia was aware of what was going on. Two days after the news broke, she died at home of cancer. She had been bedridden by that point and may not have heard the news that she had been exposed. She was 59 years old at the time of her death. In the end, no one would be held accountable. There was a bill introduced to the state legislature in 1951 to make way for a full investigation. But Crump's political influence hadn't faded quite enough yet, and it didn't pass. So Judge Kelly, who used her position to force through these adoptions, and the workers who falsified vital records, the doctors who overmedicated mothers, all walked away. Kelly did retire in the fallout, supposedly for health reasons, but likely due to the scandal. There wasn't going to be any justice for the families destroyed. Even as birth families came forward asking for help in finding their children, they couldn't get anywhere. People didn't like how Georgia Tan did what she did, and they didn't like that she embezzled money while doing it. But they also didn't entirely disapprove of these adoptions. After all, what was done was done, and weren't the children better off with their new rich parents instead of their impoverished birth parents? The closest to a resolution here was that Tennessee strengthened their laws to require more rigorous home studies for prospective parents, and they added in waiting times and such to try to prevent parents from signing away their rights immediately after birth. 
One of the things I walked away with after reading up on this was that George's adoption advocacy was designed to make her crimes even easier for her. Yet some of these policies are still in place. We talked today about open adoption, semi-open, and closed. Georgia lobbied hard to pass laws for closed adoptions that would seal the birth parents' records entirely. And as she was the leading expert on adoption, and because some legislators were her clients, she made headway with that, to the point that now, in 2022, adoptees are still fighting to have the right to their original birth certificate. This policy of fully closed, sealed adoptions was designed by a human trafficker so she could continue to get away with her crimes. Exposing the ways Georgia Tan was able to do what she did doesn't mean that we undid the adoption laws she pushed to be put into place. We still have adoption laws that vary from state to state that allow for loopholes in the law and loopholes in ethical adoption practices. We still see a disproportionate number of children from poorer homes being removed from the state. And we've had any number of scandals as parents are starting to look internationally to adopt babies. Go ahead and look up Guatemala adoption scandal on Google and prepare to read Georgia Tan's story all over again in modern times. The legacy of Georgia Tan remains in how adoptions are handled and perceived in 2022. And there's a lot of work to be done before Georgia Tan is fully erased from the adoption industry in the United States. Georgia Tan was not the only bad actor in the black market baby industry. Look up the Hicks Clinic for another similar case. It's just that what Georgia Tan did was on a scale that it's hard to wrap our minds around. Many of Georgia Tan's victims wanted to find their families who they were kidnapped from. It was not until 1995 that they were allowed to access their records. 45 years after she was exposed. Georgia had falsified and destroyed so many records that the large majority of children and families who dealt with Georgia Tan were never reunited. Many have spoken out. Unsolved Mysteries publicized the case to a new generation by profiling a few stories of those looking for their families. And this has continued. Wrestler Ric Flair may be the most famous Georgia Tan baby, and he has spoken out as well. He was adopted as an infant from Georgia Tan's home, and he brought attention to how these families were lied to, and some thought their babies were dead when instead they were sold. If you want to know more about Georgia Tan and some of the families impacted, I recommend the book The Baby Thief, The Untold Story of Georgia Tan, The Baby Seller Who Corrupted Adoption. I'll leave the name of the book in the show notes. 